basement, 203 open. Ready? All right. Here we go. Welcome to NFL 360, the NFL Network series introducing you to the people you have to meet, the places you have to see, and the stories you have to hear. I'm your host, Melissa Stark, joined by Jane Slater and Mark Kriegel. Today's show features two very different people. One is a football player. One is a football fan. Both finding the courage to do the right thing, even when it's the hardest thing. This is NFL 360. We begin with the story of a seven-year-old boy for whom every day is unpredictable, even unsafe. But as Jane Slater discovered, how he chooses to deal with his condition is simply extraordinary. You may never look at an NFL helmet the same way again. So I'm doing a live shot at the end of Cowboys camp, and I look up, and right in front of me, there's this little kid on his dad's shoulders. He gives me this sheepish little wave and this adorable little smile, and just absolutely made my day. So when the live shot's over, I walk over and he's wearing this helmet. I told him he was brave for wearing this Saints helmet at Cowboys practice. And I ask him what it's about and he tells me he has epilepsy. And the helmet protects his head in case he falls during one of these seizures. And that he's here to help get helmets for other kids with epilepsy. When he told me his story, I just, I can't shake the kid, can't shake his family. How much time do you guys spend talking football? Well, a lot of time. A lot of time? And we mostly collect cards. Give me a Derek card. No. So you guys are really, really close. Yes. Yes. When you saw him first have a seizure, what did you think? It made oh, me feel goodness. really upset. And I wish I could just take the pain away from him. His first Three and a half years of life, he was a totally happy, healthy little boy. <laughs> what was your first memory of that first seizure? Terror. Brock came running in, and, and I looked out in the backyard, and he was face down, and he wasn't moving. I legitimately thought that we had lost him, that he had died in our backyard. And I flipped him over, and his eyes were clicking and twitching, and, and I knew at that point he was having a seizure. He's a clonic, tonic, epileptic, which means that he can have a number of seizures. He could just be standing and staring out there. He could have a drop seizure, which he goes head first to the ground. If a day goes by that he has two, it's a good day. At one time, he had 100 in a day. When your mom told you that you needed to wear your helmet all the time, what did you think about that? Well, I thought it was really cool to wear my helmet like a real football player. Like a real football player? Mm -hmm. Is that how you feel when you put it on? Mm -hmm. Whose idea was it to go get those decals and put it on the helmet? That was all my dad. My dad played for 16 years in the NFL, 13 years for the Saints. We called him from the hospital and told him what was going on and that Bryson had to wear a helmet. And he had told us the next day that he called the Saints and a package was coming. We have a picture of Bryson just beaming ear to ear with the package and we put those stickers right on. He is a diehard Drew Brees fan. He is all in on Drew Brees, like hands down. All right, who's this? Drew Brees. How old are you again? Um, seven. Would you say that you know more about football than most seven-year-olds? Yes. He was lucky enough to go to a Saints practice a few years back. What was initial reaction when he found out he was going to get that opportunity? Oh, you would have thought that he had hit the lottery or something. He's bouncing off the walls, just like, you know, starts looking at the roster. Who do I get to meet? Who do I get to talk to? They were having a great time, and then about midway through, he had a seizure. What's it like when you get one? It feels weird. I don't feel so good. 
I just don't know what happens. All the fans were on one side of the practice fields, and Bryson Brock and his mom were on the total flip side. And so I just went over there with the football and just kind of, you know, just to say hi. Thomas Morstead started talking to Bryson and said, hey, we brought you over a football, and we were wondering if, you know, you wanted to have it. Um, and so immediately, Bryson came out of that seizure. And I don't even think that Thomas knows how much that meant that he took the time to come off the field from them working. She told me after the fact that that helped kind of coax him out of a seizure. It reinforces the fact that 10 seconds of your time can make somebody's day. It really surprised me that a stranger got him out of it because the only people who have been successfully to get him out of that are myself, Sarah, and our son, Brock. He's from the Giants. And it's his game-worn helmet. He wore it in a game? Yes. Wow. It's Odell Beckham Jr. Wow. So you guys have got a lot of <laughs> awesome stuff here. What are you doing with all of it? Well, we're selling it. You're selling it for who and for what? Um, for a little kid. For little kids? Uh-huh. In hope that they can go for enough to buy a helmet. Awesome. Kids having epilepsy get hurt. And so we're trying to help them so we can prevent them getting hurt. How did Helmets for Helmets start? They decided that they wanted to make their own foundation in about May. And so it's been fairly a short period of time that they've been doing this. Um, the response has just been unreal. Hello. Hi. What's up, what's up, how you doing? Good. We sold a helmet for $1,500 for a boy in Florida named Colin, and he has epilepsy too. The helmet that we, that we signed and stuff for you guys? Mm -hmm. Okay, oh, cool, cool. Perfect. let's go. Uh, keep doing everything that you're doing, man. We're, we're proud of you and we appreciate Kay. you. Yeah, thanks, man. Thank you. What does it mean to you to see these two boys working on this together? At their age, to understand that it's bigger than them. It's not about me, it's not about I, it's about how can we make others' lives better? How can we make this world a better place? And for them to get that means the world to me. Hold in real quick. Got something for you. Yes. Guess where you guys are going this weekend? Where? New Orleans. Yes! Yes! We are going to New Orleans. Yeah, 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 yeah. We try to just find the silver lining and stuff. Yeah. Oh. He does not let epilepsy get in the way. Hi, Thomas. Oh, the Thomas Morris there. How's that make you feel? It makes me feel very proud of him. Alvin, come here. How would you describe his toughness? He's the toughest person I know. What's your name, man? Bryson. Bryson. Nice to meet you, bud. Hey, Bryson, would you like to score a touchdown on the very last play of practice today? Uh-huh. All right. He, he doesn't let this stuff break him. We're going to take the handoff to Mark, give him a little pitch to Bryson here, with lead block and right in the end zone, okay? All right. Fight through. Don't be what the seizures can make you. be who and what you want to be. We typically have a breakdown here, at least on a breakdown. Here we go. And Jane Slater joins us now. Oh, I mean, this little boy just steals our hearts. You spent so much time with Bryson. What is it about him? He just radiates from within, Melissa. You know, it's one thing to meet him, but to go and spend the time that I did with him and his family at home, you see really what he goes through day to day. He's going through so much, but he doesn't let it affect him. He still has this, such an innocent enthusiasm about life and just that smile. I think you're smiling because I think you're seeing yeah. what I saw. He's just, he's such an infectious little personality. And his brother, Brock, who's just a couple years older, is amazing. What's his role in helping support him? He loves protecting his little brother. I, I think that comes through in the piece. Uh, That's a huge responsibility. It's, it's huge. And he's just two years older than Bryson at nine years old, but mm -hmm. he has such an old soul. And what really struck me during my visit to their house was they have their little office set up in one of the playrooms. And he says, Miss Jane, and he points to the computer. He says, this is where I go to get all of the team's addresses so I can ask them for more helmets and jerseys. He's like, 
look at my letters and the letters are written in crayon. Oh, that's and so good. if that doesn't touch you, I don't know what will, but I think it speaks to the fact that these kids really are fully invested and believe in this organization. Well, and in the piece, it's amazing because they're able to sell a helmet to buy one for another little boy with epilepsy. How much does one of these helmets cost? Varying degrees, you can go anywhere from 600 to 6,000, and right now they're 6,000. 6, right now they're trying to raise money for a little boy. His, his is a little bit more complicated. He needs a hard, hard helmet as opposed to the soft shell that Bryson has. Uh, so I was really impressed with their efforts to do that because they say in a lot of cases, insurance companies just don't cover it. So they mm. really hope that this charity closes that financial burden for some of these families. And we see in the piece that he gets to meet his hero, Drew Brees. I mean, what was that like for him? I was there for his meeting uh, in Metairie at the facility and he just lit up. It was almost like he had a, a moment of confidence slash nervousness when he introduced himself. I loved that moment. Mm -hmm. And then after that, Breeze walks over and hands him tickets to Monday Night Football. And of course, we all know what happened on Monday Night Football. He ends up breaking the record and then they shot video of it and sent it to me. And you've got to see this. It's Bryson's reaction to his idol breaking the record Oh on a night gosh. that he was gifted tickets from right. him. It's just, it's, you can't write these stories. Right, a night he will never forget. Never forget. So I'm sure everybody who's watched us talking right now in this piece wants to know how to get involved with Helmets for Helmets. So go to helmetsforhelmets.com. Uh, they have so many amazing items, helmets, jerseys, you name it, they've got it. We're all rooting for them. Thanks, Jane. Thank you. On February 14th of this year in Parkland, Florida, 17 people were shot and killed at Stoneman Douglas High School. Parents lost children. Teenagers lost friends. Dallas Cowboys wide receiver Alan Hearns was left asking how he could help. As you're about to see, it began with a simple but loving act of listening. As a parent, you just try to protect your kids so much. And uh, just the last thing you think of is you send them to school and they don't come home. You know, it's, it's absolutely the worst thing in life to ever happen to a parent is to lose your child. I changed my number to 17 for the Stoneman Douglas shooting. 17 people lost their lives. People all across the world need to hear the story and just realize what these kids are going through, what these families are going through. I grew up probably about 45 minutes away from here, you know, down in Miami Gardens. I was watching TV at the time, and the TV shifted, you know, that was on every channel. Daniel, you right here, shots fired by the football field. Shots fired by the football field. We're walking down the school right now. My call this year is Safer Schools. Today I came back to South Florida just to have a conversation with a couple of the kids, you know, they experienced it. On February 14th, I was in class, and I remember the fire alarm had went off, and it was like 20 minutes left in the day, so we just thought the day was gonna be over. And then as we opened the door, we heard like a loud bang. SWAT came in, and then we ended up running outside with our hands above our heads. Had to throw our bags in the streets, everything, and the second you walk outside, you see caution tape, giant, enormous guns, uh, helicopters in the air, things that you see in TV and TV, movies. Right. The worst part for me was just not knowing. I texted my parents and my sister and my brother, and I said, I love you guys. But like a few seconds later, I realized it's Valentine's Day. They won't understand what I mean by just saying I love you. They're gonna think it's a typical Valentine's Day text. My friend is walking Oliver, and he had passed in the shooting. It just shows that like in a blink of an eye, like someone can be gone from you at any point, because I remember walking him to that class, like fourth period, we gave each other a hug and just said love you or whatever, and like, thinking like an hour into my next class that like that would have been my last moment and that's something I would have never believed. Yeah. I know that's for sure it's like something that, that doesn't feel real. You know, I went to Miami Carroll City, around there, you know, it's a lot of violence. You know, it's, it's, there was times where the school was on lockdown, but nothing to the capacity of what you guys went through. So this is uh, Alyssa's room. You have to excuse the mess. <laughs> she was a little messy. My daughter was shot 10 times with an AR-15 gun at Snowman Douglas High School. 
Alyssa was amazing. She, uh, this was her soccer picture when she was little, when she was three. <laughs> <laughs> That's adorable. <laughs> uh. Yeah. When this happened, it empowered me to want to make change. And I started a nonprofit organization called Make Our School Safe. Alyssa was in the first classroom, and the shooter shot through the glass. So some of the things that we could do now is put bulletproof glass in the classroom door to help protect the students. And then the students can run to the safe zone area that could be marked out with red tape. Alyssa was shot the first time, but if she was empowered to know where to go, to know where that safe zone area was, she might still be alive today. You know, I try to remember the good times with Alyssa. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for me to be an activist, to, to being on doing all these things, right. it's just helping, helping me, but I want to help other kids too, because it's not fair. We, we have to do something. Right. This can't keep happening. Uh, coming here, you know, hearing your side of the story is very touching. You know, that's why I want to do this. I want people beyond Florida to uh, realize well, what's going on. My name is Max Schachter, and my little boy Alex was one of the first victims of the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas massacre. And um, Alex was a great little boy. Alan, this is Alex's room. Sorry, man, there's no, there's no cowboys here. No, it's all good. <laughs> oh, man. I know Safe Schools for Alex, you know, it's a local organization, but I know you guys are doing things national. So what are some of the solutions that you're coming up with? So what I set out to do after Alex was murdered is to create national school safety best practices. After 9-11, they made the airport safe. But it's been 20 years since Columbine almost, and we still have school shootings. The expertise is there, but the problem is there's no best practices nationally. And so that's what I have been on a mission to create. So what gives you hope? Eventually we'll put an end to this by creating more awareness, starting clubs up around the country and even internationally. After the shooting happened, I helped lead the efforts for the March in Parkland and then after that, started a nonprofit organization that's called Empower the People, which Alyssa is also a really huge part of. Just like putting in the effort and like the work in the grind to just make sure that like we work as hard as we possibly can to make a change so that nobody else has to go through something like this. That's what gives me hope. I think this is a historic moment for teens in that we're now able to have our voices heard about how safe we want to feel at schools. And I think that with your jersey, with your number, with your cleats, this all goes to spreading awareness throughout the country that there needs to be a paradigm shift in how we approach school safety. When I chose number 17, you know, each and every day when I go to practice or when I have a game, you know, I'm also thinking about those families. I know it's not a thing that can happen today or tomorrow, but we are going to make schools safer. You can join Alan Hearns in protecting students and teachers by visiting MakeOurSchoolSafe.org and SafeSchoolsForAlex.org. For Dallas Cowboys wide receiver Alan Hearns, My Cause, My Cleats was his chance to honor 17 shooting victims in Parkland, Florida. Here's Mark Kriegel with a final note. He's not a name, an activist, or a pro bowler. He's not even a quarterback. Alan Hearns is just a ball player with a big heart. And that's the point. What do you say to a parent whose 14-year-old has been shot 10 times with an AR-15 assault rifle? I don't know. I'm not sure Hearns knew either. There's not a playbook you can study for that. But he was there, and that means something. You saw the way the parents looked to him? That meant something, too. And a lot of it had to do with Hearns just being in the NFL. So should ball players be role models or shut up and dribble? Here's the truth. 
we want athletes to signify something, to represent, but we're not all comfortable when it gets political. So while the right of American children not to be shot in school seems like a cause for our time, it leaves a guy like Alan Hearns to navigate this tricky, narrow corridor in American life. He's from a Miami neighborhood accustomed to gun violence. Parkland in nearby Broward County is a relatively affluent community. But something in the slaughter spoke to him. So he wears 17 to honor the dead and their names on his cleats. But it's not the uniform, it's his heart. And it should be ours too. Powerful stuff, Mark, thank you. With repetition, expressions like giving back, paying it forward, thoughts and prayers can lose their power and begin to sound scripted. But it's important to remember those catchphrases are inspired by causes, championed by people who care, people who find the courage to give back and pay it forward when it seemed thoughts and prayers were all they had. For NFL 360, I'm Melissa Stark.